we're going back to Hebrews chapter 13, the last chapter of Hebrews. And interestingly enough, and I love it, we're going to kind of cover this uh, weirdly in two parts through these first uh, six verses. But the reason I'm doing this is because I want to emphasize certain things. Uh, certainly the writer of Hebrews has emphasized that. He's just spent 12 chapters talking to us about the uh, theological implications of our salvation in Christ. And now he's going to move us from those theological implications uh, to the practical implications of belonging to Christ in which it's not only that we walk by faith, but we also respond uh, to Christ by faith. We also live by faith. We also trust by by faith. And so here's where he's moving us from. Here's what we believe. Here's what's happened in you if you belong to Christ. Here's why this has happened to you. And now here's how you're going to respond in the world. Here's what real saving uh, faith looks like and responds like. And so for us, it's very, very practical, although I'm not going to cover every aspect of it, but I do want to emphasize that this is what true saving faith responds like. Or, or acts like. We can put it a number of different ways. When we left off in chapter 12, if you remember in our last study, we saw that God's goal for your Christian life, in fact, if you look back at chapter 12 with me, we saw that God's goal for your Christian life uh, back in verse 10 uh, is that his goal for your Christian walk or your Christian life is that you would share in his holiness. That's what he wants uh, from you. That is his goal for you, uh, which as we saw last time, simply means that God's goal for your life is that you are being transformed more and more into the image of Christ. That is your life in him, that you are image bearers. Remember, we've seen that a number of times and talked about that a number of times in which we are to be lights in the world. In other words, when people see us, when people see how we respond uh, to the Word of God, it reflects the character and nature of Christ. That's what we do. That is our life, right? That we would be sanctified or be continuously transformed into the image of Christ. And God does this, right? We saw that in chapter 12. God does this by purposely pre-wiring events and circumstances in your life sometimes that are designed to cause you to walk by faith. In other words, this it's not your best life now, but God's going to work these things in your life so that you are constantly clinging to Christ. In fact, look at verse 10, that our Father in heaven, right, is always disciplining us or training us for our good. Remember, we looked at that in verse 10, uh, because He loves us in verse 6, okay? He makes that very clear. And then He says in verse 11 that God always has us in the spiritual gymnasium, so to speak, right? Uh, in verse 11, so that it would yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness that God's promise to us, right, in verse 26 is that He's going to shake things up. We didn't really get to talk about this verse last time, but God is going to shake things up in this world, right? Uh, so that our hope and faith are firmly rooted in Christ and His Word and not in the things of this world that are temporary, right? That's the whole point. So when everything goes off the rails right in this world, we're still going to be clinging to Christ. Or if we are still clinging to Christ, we're still clinging to His Word. That is proof to us, and that was his whole point in chapter 12, it is proof to us or that we can have confidence in uh, that we are legitimate sons and daughters of God. Okay, It's not that your life is going to get better, right? It's that your life is going to become uh, more focused on Christ as we're going to come more dedicated to Christ. Look at verse 26. I want you to see this. This is in chapter 12 still. We'll get to chapter 13 in a second here. Verse 26, and God's voice shook the earth then. Remember, that was uh, when God gave the law at Mount Sinai and the Israelites couldn't go, uh, go on to that mountain for fear of being uh, destroyed by God. He says, and God's voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also uh, the heaven. Verse 27, this expression, yet once more, 
the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that the things that which cannot be shaken may remain, right? So God is going to, just like he says, everything that is temporary in this world, that's all going to go away, right? And he's going to shake things up in this world so that we would be holding fast to those things that are eternal, right? What cannot be shaken in this life, right? That's the faith that you and I have in Christ. That cannot be shaken. This eternal life that we have in Christ that cannot be shaken no matter what happens in the world and so we understand that God is just going to allow the things in the world to crumble around us okay to crumble around us so that we are clinging to Christ so that we are dependent on Christ or you could say uh, that God's going to allow the things of the world to crumble down around us to make our faith more what unshakable okay and that's a precious and loving God to us. We looked at that, saw all those things um, in chapter 12. And if you don't think God is shaking things up a bit, I don't know if you're actually paying attention to what's going on in the world. Okay? And so God has designed that purposely. But the whole point is, and here's what I want you to, to remember as we go through this, right? The whole point is that the faith that believes Christ and His Word is also the faith that responds to Christ and His Word. Okay? can't say that you believe and you love and you trust Christ and then sit on your butt for 40 years. It's not going to happen. Okay? There's no faith in that whatsoever. Okay? All that is is, is is word only, right? True saving faith responds to Christ. It obeys Christ. It walks in His Word. That real saving faith is not only made evident by what we say, but that real saving faith is made evident by what we do. Okay? You can't be saved by works, but certainly we're, uh, salvation is going to produce something in you that begins to be obedient to Christ, that begins to display the character and nature of Christ. That's the whole point. Uh, mostly that if we're truly being transformed into the image of Christ, then it is this image, this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get into our brain, it is this image of Christ in us that begins to be displayed uh, to the world. Okay? Or to put it another way, that we should begin to reflect uh, the character of Christ who is in us, right? Look at verse 28. This is what he says, and then this will bring us in to chapter 13, verse 28. He says, therefore, since uh, we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, right? Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service, he says, with reverence and awe. And so the only acceptable service that we can offer to God, I want you to understand this because this becomes important in our, in our theological understanding of who we are. The only acceptable service you can offer as uh, Christians uh, is only through Christ's work in you, right? Through His sanctifying work in you, through all of those things that He promises to do through you, right? Uh, he, it can only be offered through those who believe Christ and trust Christ and obey Christ. Okay, that's been his whole point. Okay, if you're in this, and we talk about this all the time, if you're, if you're pretending or, or you're, you're not sure or whatever's going on in your life, okay, and you're going to try to rewire your own life uh, to try to fit this Christian standard, you're eventually going to fail miserably, okay? And so what he says is the only way that this can be accomplished, the only sacrifice that God accepts comes from those who believe and trust and obey Christ, okay? That's the whole point. There's no other sacrifice you can make for God that he will accept. And so in chapter 13, like I said, the writer of Hebrews is moving us from this theological implications of saving faith into the practical application of real saving faith, right? In other words, what does real, uh, how does real saving faith respond uh, in this world? And so let's look at verses one through six. We'll read these, we'll pray, and then we'll go through this a little bit this morning. Chapter 13, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says, Let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect the strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers 
right? God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. With praise and worship on our lips, Father, we come here with this intent that we're going to uh, surrender to you, that we're going to worship you freely, Father God, that we're going to be unhindered uh, by the cares of the world. And your promise to us is that you're going to continue uh, to sanctify us in this manner, that you're going to continue uh, to transform us, to conform us uh, into the image of your Son. And we know that this doesn't come uh, without trouble and, and trials and all the things that you have promised to us in Scripture. And so, Lord, this morning, I'm praying that we would hear these words, um, but we would not, like James says, just uh, be hearers, but that we would be doers, Father God, that you would compel us through the Spirit of God and the things in which we should respond, Lord, the things in which we should see, and, and most importantly, uh, those motives that we have for all of these things, Father, that we would see the glory and the beauty of Christ in our lives. Uh, not only that, Lord, that we would be concerned, that we would have a compassion for those in the world to see the glory of Christ as well. Uh, you've been more than faithful to all of us, um, even when we haven't been faithful, Lord. You've been more than kind to us, uh, even though when we haven't been kind ourselves, you have been long-suffering with us, even though... We don't deserve uh, your dedication, Father, but we are thankful this morning for those things. And so we are thankful mostly for Christ and for his shedding of the blood on the cross, which makes all these things possible, Lord. So we pray this morning that we would be hearers, as Jesus said, that he who has ears, let him hear, Father God, that we might love you more, that we might know you, that we might honor you in everything that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Now, when we talk about Christian character, we're not talking about some kind of internal moral reform. Are you with me on that so far? When we talk about Christian character, we're talking about that thing which God does in you through the Holy Spirit uh, that transforms you or transforms the life of a believer, right? These are things that begin to be manifested in you, in the life of a believer. It's not merely about this external transformation, these things that we can control on on the outside. It's about what's happening or beginning to happen to us on the inside. And so the objective work of Christ in you, right, is that, that, is that it begins to make itself evident not only to us, but also begins to make it evident to the world. We just sang this song this morning about this changed life, right? And so we believe, right, that once saved, always changed, right? There's, Christ is always going to be transforming us, and so that's going to begin to play out. If you're looking at our verses, right, it's going to begin to play out in the way that we continue to love one another. It's going to play out in the way that we continue to serve, right, one another unconditionally. It's going to begin uh, to play out in the way that we engage the world, right? That's going to be the, that, that internal response that you have, even if, let me help you out with something, even if you find yourself pushing back against it a lot, Okay, one of the things that I find in my Christian walk is the things that I'm pushing back against the most are the things that the Spirit is working on me the most. And so when I don't feel like I want to do that, I know that the Spirit of God is the one who's kind of punching me in the gut on that and trying to get me to go in a particular direction. And so you got to remember these Hebrew believers, right? They are beginning to shrink back from doing these things. And there's a couple of different reasons. Remember, they're being persecuted, first of all, right? Uh, they're being persecuted by their own brethren, by their own family members who haven't followed them with Christ, and they're beginning to suffer. And so they're beginning to shrink back from or neglect those things that God has called them to do. That God says, hey man, here's what we're going to do. We are going to be a light to the world, and we're going to do that regardless of how the world treats us, okay? And so they're beginning to shrink back from that. And this is getting too difficult. It costs too much. 
And so the character of Christ in us begins to be manifested. The writer of Hebrews says like this, he says, if you're looking at verse one, that we have this continuing love for the brethren, right? It's in the way that we show hospitality to strangers in verse two. Uh, it's going to begin to manifest itself in the way that we show uh, compassion for the prisoners or those who are ill-treated, Okay, let me help you out with that verse real quick because we're not going to talk about it today, but he's not talking about those dudes who rob banks. Okay, he's talking about believers who are being persecuted for the faith. Okay, I I love people that do prison ministry. I'm not going to push back at it at all. But when we talk about biblical definition of prison ministry, it is visiting those believers who are being uh, incarcerated for preaching and teaching Christ. But anyway, he says that this is going to begin to manifest itself in the way that we treat those who are ill-treated. Uh, if you look at verse 4, it's going to be manifested in the way that we, we honor marriage, that we, we, we do those things that God has ordained. It's going to be manifested uh, in the freedom. If you look at verse 5, uh, freedom from the preoccupation with material gain, right? The love of money. It's going to be manifested uh, in the absence of worry and fear in the midst of a chaotic and an upside down world. That's what he says it's going to look like. That's what's going to begin to happen in your life. And the reason this is so imperative is because this type of response reveals the character and nature of Christ. It reveals the love of Christ to the world. Okay. This is why we, we hold this so dear. Why? Because the world doesn't act like this. I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on, but the world doesn't act like this. The world doesn't behave like this. The world doesn't believe like this, right? The world is basically uh, antisocial and narcissistic, right? Facebook, Instagram, all of those things that talk about me and never talk about you, right? Uh, The world worships sexual immorality. I don't know if you've noticed, right? There's not a movie, a cartoon, a kid's show. I'm talking about two-year-old infant kid cartoon shows that you can watch that doesn't deal in some form of sexual immorality. The world is enamored with that. There's no faithfulness to marriage. There's no marriage whatsoever. They hate marriage. Uh, The world is enamored with self-pleasure and notoriety and material gain. Okay, We see that all around us. It's prevalent. It's so easy to get caught up in that. Paul told Timothy, here's what the last days are going to look like. I want you to read this. But realize this, in the last days, remember the last days when he says that is everything after Christ's death and resurrection. That's the last days, okay? There's nothing new happening to us today that hasn't been happening forever. But listen to what he says. He says, but realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You don't think people are lovers of self? Oh my gosh, I remember the day, and I'm not that old when you used to have a camera to take pictures of everyone else. Are you with me? I like to watch those funny videos. They have a channel that just shows funny videos. And I am astonished. Everybody's taking pictures of themselves. There's nobody around. And they're just taking pictures of themselves. That's all they do is take pictures of themselves. When I stop at the stoplight, do this the next time you're at a stoplight in a busy intersection and look around at all the other cars. What are they doing? They're looking down at their phones because they want to see who's loving me right now. They can't even drive to the grocery store without seeing who's loving me right now. This is the world that we live in. And so when we come out and we say, hey, you know what, check this out. We're going to try to love everybody else, even imperfectly. We're going to try to love everyone else because this looks different than the world. This is uncharacteristic of the world. But the whole point is that is that when we as believers, right, when we begin to adopt the philosophies of the world, right, then we don't look any different. And the whole point is, why would the world believe Christ if they see that we don't believe Christ? Right? If we don't trust Christ, if we're not obeying Christ, why would they want to, why would they think that they needed Christ? Remember, this isn't just about an external transformation here, right? The world is capable of doing good. 
The okay, Bible even tells us that. The world is capable of doing good. It just doesn't count for anything because it's not done in Christ. And so we don't want to just reform our external behavior for the sake of the world. We want this to be actually transforming us on the inside. Why? Because you want to know that you have a relationship with Christ. Remember the goal in, in, in doing good here is Please God, not men. Do you understand that? The goal in, in our doing good is to please God, not men. The goal in our doing good is to glorify Christ, not us. That's the whole point. In fact, uh, look down at verses 20 and 21 here. This is what he says, right? He says, Now the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you, right? May he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working that which is what? Pleasing in his sight. He is going to work in you to do those things that is pleasing in his sight. And why? With the goal through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That is the whole ball of wax for us. And so we are doing these things not because we, we desire the world to, to like us or to think that we're good people. We're doing this because we want to please Christ. This is what pleases Christ. This is what glorifies Christ. That's our whole purpose. Okay? Things like the writer of Hebrews says, continuing in the love of the brethren, showing hospitality to strangers, identifying with the captives, honoring marriage, right? And being uh, content with the things that we have. These are the things that please Christ. And so these things are the things that, uh, that convey to the world that we believe and trust Christ. That's the whole point. And so this morning, I'm not going to go through all of these, okay? We've talked about some of these before, right? Showing love for the brethren. We kind of get that already, okay? We've talked about that a number of times. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, visiting prisoners. Most of us uh, in America, unfortunately, don't even know anybody uh, in prison for uh, preaching Christ. Uh, and we're going to deal with some of these other topics uh, next week as we finish this uh, part two on that. But what I wanted to concentrate on this morning, the one that we're going to look at, what we're going to focus on uh, is this hospitality to strangers. And the reason I want to focus on that one this morning, because I believe that that's the one that we struggle with the most. Okay. I believe this is one that we struggle with the most. I know I do. Right? And the writer here, Hebrews here is not simply just talking about uh, hospitality with one another. We're pretty good at that. We understand that. And he's not talking about going to Pottery Barn, buying some, uh, what do they call those things that go underneath the plates, right? Uh, platters and fancy silverware and putting out your best china when people come over. That's not the hospitality he's talking about. Okay? He's talking about uh, showing hospitality uh, towards strangers, right? Look at verse 2. He says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. And so the word hospitality here literally means, right, uh, to show favor or uh, to be kind or take care of someone who is outside of your sphere. Okay? It's not the ones you love. It's not your friends. It's not the people that are good to you. It's those who are outside of uh, your sphere, right? That feel, that love. And then xenia, right, is the love for others or uh, the kindness to others. Uh, it's, it's those who are, uh, maybe they're like-minded, maybe they're not like-minded. Uh, and the whole idea here is that you're literally bringing them into your home, okay? And we're not talking about just individual houses. It could be our home right here today. But for the most part, it's talking about this individual uh, hospitality to strangers, bringing someone into your life, bringing someone into your home. And so the reason I say that we struggle with this the most is because if you're like me, you're going to be counting the cost when this comes into your life. Isn't that not right? There's a, you're going to be thinking about what it's going to cost you uh, to bring somebody uh, into your life, to bring others into your life. Uh, this fear of being taken advantage of, right? Uh, I could be taken advantage of. I could be used by others uh, for their own uh, benefit, right? And so we're always going to 
try to figure things out so that it's the safest bet for us. My wife and I were just talking about this a couple weeks ago. We've had the same couches in our living room for, I don't know, 15, 18 years, whatever it is. And they're trashed because boys don't sit on the cushions. They sit on the, the arms. You already know this. And so we were talking about buying new couches, and I thought, man, I don't, I don't want to buy new couches, baby. We got dudes sleeping on our couch all the time. We got people coming in. We got all this stuff going on, and we're just going to buy new couches, and somebody's just going to come in and, and do this real conversation, right? And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, man, is couches really what you want to be the most important thing in your life? You know? And we do. We have people sleeping all the time. We, uh, we, and it's just one of those things. And so we struggle with, right? We have these battles with ourselves over these things. Um, but the goal of Christianity, right? The goal of Christian hospitality uh, is not to leave us warm and fuzzy inside. Do you understand? The goal of Christian hospitality is to leave us looking more and more like Christ. Are you with me? And so this is going to cost you. It is going to be something that's going to cost you to look more and more like Christ, right? One commentator said this, and I like it. I very rarely quote people, but I'm going to quote this. She said, sadly, it seems many in our Christian community would not want Jesus to stay at their house with the sinners and the outcasts that he might be bringing with him. I thought, wow. That might be true sometimes for us, isn't it? Remember Jesus' indictment in Matthew 25. What did he say? He said, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. He says, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And so we think about this, right? We are not acting on our own. We're acting on behalf of Christ. This is what he desires. But again, the point is, right? If we're not willing to put ourselves out there, then how in the world uh, are people going to see or experience the love of Christ? How are they going to see that if we're never, ever, ever going to take a chance? If we're never, ever, ever going to sacrifice ourselves, so to speak? I mean, will we be taken advantage of? Absolutely. Right? That's the, I mean, there's, that's a given. Uh, are people going to use you to get what they want all the time, right? Are you going to surrender? Are you going to, are you going to have to give up your possessions and your comfort and your security all the time? That's just comes with it. But I mean, it costs Jesus everything to bring you into salvation. So why wouldn't it cost us everything? Those are the questions you got to ask yourself, right? I can't tell you how many times, and this is for real, I can't tell you how many times when God brings somebody into my life that doesn't fit my mold, right? Or God brings somebody into my life uh, that doesn't believe what I believe, or God brings me someone into my life who I know for a fact is going to take advantage of me, Okay? And I have to have this little argument with myself inside and it takes everything I have not to just say, no, it would be easier and more comfortable and less fearful if I just said no. But I also know that the Spirit of God is working on my heart on these things. He wants me, He wants me to sacrifice myself in that way. And so I have to fight that temptation every time in me that desires to be safe or to be comfortable uh, or to be content. Because that's really what God is asking us to give up. Right? Are you willing to give up your contentment and your comfort uh, for the sake of others, for the sake of revealing or manifesting the love of Christ to the world? And so I always have to remind myself, and I think this is probably good for you to remember as well, that everything that we do for Christ, right, including hospitality to strangers, requires faith. Do you understand? It requires faith. 
Everything that we do for Christ, including hospitality, requires faith. It requires us to live and to walk by faith. Because the truth is, I mean, think about it for you, and I think about this a lot. This is something that God constantly reminds me of. There was somebody in my life in the past, right, who gave up their comfort, security, and their uh, contentment uh, to show the love of Christ to me. And that's the reason I'm here today. Okay? That's the reason that all of you are here today is because somebody overcame that fear. Somebody overcame uh, all of those uh, objections uh, to being hospitable to those that aren't in their sphere, right? And remember, we're not looking for earthly rewards here. I mean, if you're in this uh, Christian walk for some kind of earthly, you're going to be really disappointed, Okay but we're looking forward to those heavenly rewards, right? This is what Jesus said. I love this one too. Jesus said, if you do good to those who good do to, if, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners led to sinners, uh, lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies, he says, and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind, right, to ungrateful and evil men. And don't you see it in that verse? right? At some point, right? Uh, God was kind when you were ungrateful and you were evil. And so he expects us to go out there and be kind and be hospitable, right? To those who are ungrateful and those who are evil. Why? Because you know what? There's going to come a day, hopefully, and that's what we're working towards, that they might be glorifying Christ when he returns. That's the goal. That's really the reward, um, that's really the thing that if we have this heart for Christ um, is what's being manifested in us. Look what uh, Paul says in Romans 5. This is really good for us. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to notice something in this verse because it's very, very, very important. The word demonstrates is in the present tense. Did you see that? It's not Christ demonstrated his love for you in the past. It is Christ is demonstrating his love for you right now. It is present tense. It is every moment of your life. It is every day. It is every morning. It is every evening. It is every time you're asleep and it is every time you are awake. He not only did it when you were sinners, but he's doing it right now for you. Uh, in this life, and he expects us, right? He expects us uh, to show the world uh, that Christ is still demonstrating that kind of love. Isn't that the truth, though? Think about this. How does God demonstrate his own love towards us? How is he demonstrating that in your life right now? Well, I'll tell you this, because you're walking around imperfectly everywhere you go, okay? There's no person who believes Christ, who trusts Christ, is going to tell the world that they've got it all down and everything's perfect. So every time that you are imperfect, right, and God still displays his grace and love towards you, the world sees that. Don't you understand? We don't want to go out there and go, hey, look, I've got it all down. I want you to have it all down. We're like, no, we don't have it all down. We're constantly uh, tempted to fall apart each and every day but we don't. Why? Because Christ is still demonstrating his love towards us each and every day. And he can demonstrate his love towards you, right? By faith in Christ alone. That's what we want to teach the world. So is showing unconditional hospitality to strangers going to cost you your comfort, your security, and your contentment? Absolutely. Just know it is, absolutely. But I can tell you this, right? The blessing that you give and the blessing that you receive will far outweigh any, any uh, kind of inconvenience that you might incur. I know that's been true in my life. I have never not been blessed by taking in even those who have totally used me, rejected me, abused me. There's never been a time Right, It was Jesus who said it's more blessed uh, to give uh, than to receive. And so in this verse, there is a promised blessing that I want you to see here. 
Look at verse 2 again with me. He says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have what? Entertained angels without knowing it. Now, I don't want you to get too hung up on that word angels here, okay? Because I know people love, oh my gosh, you know. The problem is, angelos can mean either real live angels or it can just simply mean messengers of blessing, okay? And so it's not that it's not true. Okay, we already know that it's true. Remember, Abraham and Sarah entertained, right? The pre-incarnate Christ entertained the angels uh, when they came to his house. He showed hospitality to them and they delivered the message uh, that Sarah was going to have a child, right? And so there is a blessing that comes from that and they entertained those angels. But for us, it can simply just mean that God is going to bring you into the sphere of someone else who is going to end up being a blessing in your life and I don't know how but all I know is that I have never been disappointed uh, when God has basically shoved me into uh, duty uh, in, in, in showing hospitality to others showing the love of Christ to others I've never been disappointed I just never have it's never caused me to say man I'm never going to do this again Okay, there's always a blessing that comes with it This entertaining angels, the word for this entertaining angels is interesting. It means to be astonished. It means to be amazed. It literally means to entertain a guest, but it comes with those kind of descriptions. And I can tell you, I have never, ever not been astonished. I have never, ever not been amazed in all of the times that I have just unconditionally given myself away. I think God honors that and he blesses that if you're just willing to set aside all of your fears and your comfort and your security uh, to give yourselves away to others. But practically speaking, it just might mean, I mean, the writer's whole point might just mean that, you know what, when you unconditionally give yourself away to others, what you're displaying is that the love of Christ has for the world. And they might see that. Okay? They might not. They might go away. They might steal your car. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. You're not going to take your car with you anyway. Okay? I actually had a missionary that I, I love this guy dearly. He had like 10 boxes of Bibles that he was taking to some foreign country. And before he could even get it in country, somebody stole the truck with all the Bibles in it. And I thought, man, that's tragic. How are you going to share the love of Christ? You know, I was a young guy. How are you going to share the love of Christ now uh, in this place that you were going, in this village you were going? He goes, I don't care. All I'm hoping is the guys that stole my truck have 200 Bibles now in order to read the Word of God. And so I'm thinking, man, I'm never going to have a heart like that. But that's the blessing, isn't it? That's really the blessing uh, that the Lord Jesus would equip you in every good thing to do as wheel working, which is those things which are pleasing in his sight. That's our goal. We just want to be pleasing in your sight, Lord. If that's not your daily prayer, uh, prayer, make it your daily prayer. But I'm telling you right now, it's the most dangerous prayer that you can pray. Okay? Because when you're begging God in the morning, when you get up, man, I just want to be pleasing in your sight today. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to bring someone or something into your life that's going to take away your security, it's going to take away your comfort, and it's going to take away your contentment because he wants you to demonstrate the love of Christ to the world. But I encourage you, I encourage you this morning with those things. And I don't have a real good segue this morning for communion, but I just want to share with you this morning that before we think about communion, that this whole thing, right, that we've been talking about this morning, this showing hospitality, this way that we uh, display Christ to the world, that's what communion is all about, right? That we are remembering Christ's death and that we are eagerly awaiting his return. And that eagerly awaiting his return causes us to do what? It causes us to want to please Christ. It causes us uh, to respond. Uh, to the word of God. It causes us uh, to want to go out there and glorify Christ with everything that we do, including communion this morning. And so let me pray for us this morning, and then we'll uh, drink the cup and eat the bread. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. Uh, It is encouraging to us, Lord. There's so many different ways to say Uh, be hospitable to strangers. And so my only prayer has been, Father, that we would be gentle and kind, that, that, you know, we all 
fail in this sometimes. We all are not as uh, proficient at this as we would like to be. We're not always as loving uh, as we could be. We're not all, always as sacrificial as we could be, Lord. But the, the, the grace and the blessing here this morning, Father, the, the glory here this morning is that Christ was that Christ was all of those things in our place and by faith in him, uh, we inherit that righteousness, Father God, that Christ is pleased with us uh, when we were doing those things that pleased him. And so that's what we wanna get from this this morning, Father. Uh, We thank you uh, for all the blessings uh, that you give us. We thank you for your word. Uh, It is encouraging to us, Lord, uh, because it helps us to navigate this world. It helps us to see those things Uh, that most honor you, Father God. It also helps us uh, to be confident in the things that you say. And so we are thankful this morning that we are together. We're thankful for the fellowship of the believers. We're thankful uh, for the word of God. We're thankful for the worship. We're thankful for all of these things, Lord. Gosh, you are just so gracious to us, Father. And I just pray that the rest of our day uh, would be filled uh, with remembrance of you in these things. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, this morning, as we talked about many times in communion, uh, Paul says before we can uh, eat the bread and drink the cup, we must examine ourselves, right? We must examine ourselves. And what he's talking about is um, not the fact that uh, you're worthy of being here this morning and eating the bread and drinking the cup. None of you are worthy for that. Christ is the only thing that has made you worthy. But what he is talking about is that we are walking in a manner worthy of our calling. In other words, uh, it's about relationships, right? It's about our relationships with each other. It's about our relationship with Christ. And so brothers and sisters this morning, if you're here uh, and you have uh, faith and trust in Christ, right? You have committed your life to Christ. We encourage you to eat the bread and drink the cup. Uh, But if there is something going on in your life, right, that is causing you um, to question your relationship, or maybe it's causing you uh, even to question your own sanctification at this point, sin in your life, whatever it is in your life, God says that you will honor him, uh, you will believe him uh, by not eating the bread and drinking the cup at this time because those things aren't right either with the relationships that you have in the world or your relationship with him. And for those of you this morning that are here that do not have a relationship with Christ, God also says that you will honor him uh, if you do not eat the bread or drink the cup. He says, in fact, you'll bring greater condemnation on yourself if you do this falsely. If you do this to be seen by men or you do this because you might be in, embarrassed, uh, you don't want anybody to know uh, that you're not a Jesus believer. But I'm telling you, and I say this honestly uh, and wholeheartedly, there's no one in here that trusts and believes and loves Christ that would ever look down on you because we've all been in that seat, okay? We've all sat there and listened to the word of God. We've all sat there and sung the songs. We've all sat there and, and, and played along with what was going on, uh, not really knowing Christ, but here we are today, right? Christ has transformed us. And so that's always our hope for you. So this morning, uh, as we begin communion, I want to give you some instructions Uh, we have new cups this morning and I'm not sure how they work Uh, Shireen uh, bought these for us uh, w- because it was just a little bit more convenient. We, we didn't know how many people we would have at any given time. So in these, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You kind of peel the top for the bread and then the second layer for the drink, right? Just so I don't think anybody's going to get lost. I'm just trying to help you out here, okay? Uh, it's not that big a deal. So if you would come up this morning uh, along with the worship team and we'll begin uh, communion, just uh, grab a cup and go back to your seat, please. 